I guess the things that are mo most important to me, I don't know whether I added that to it or not, was, you know, the, the, my, um, I, I guess architecture is a public concern because uh, th that's been in every way, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the um, public hearings and, you know, that, that, my, that doesn't really come out in the, um, in the bio so much, but that was something that didn't exist here. And that I absolutely put into place, and it's very, very important because, you know, I, I find so many uh, problems exist because there's no process. Mm -hmm. There's no way, you know, people fight and things like that, but there's no way of having a, a well organized process <clears throat> where people say what the, you know, first of all, it's presentation mm -hmm. of the problem by both sides, let's say, and then there's a, uh, then people have time to, you know, study it. You come back and make a presentation formally on paper and in presentation or just in presentation. And then that's that, 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 that to a jury. And then that jury, um, um, you know, we're, uh, comes up with it. That's the public ones. But there's also process of, of, of the um, uh, sort of a local, what is it called? A, a um, <laughs> table de consultation, table of... of uh, discussion in which uh, a neighborhood, whatever, however you define that, uh, you know, works with the city on a problem and works with the people, the, all the people around. So it's this very large process. And that, you know, the secret building is part of that. I mean, everything is part. Sure. Yes. And I, I think we're definitely going to dive into all of that. I'm, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts of, of how that process can be uh, bettered or rectified but starting earlier i guess more or less at the beginning <laughs> okay <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you're born in montreal right and you had a, a talent for sculpture and and art and things from a pretty young age is that correct yes yeah well uh, uh <clears throat> you know was, uh that, that, that was very hugely important to me mm. because you know in my house we were brought up in a very horrible, strict way with nannies. And, you know, you, you had to behave properly, you had to eat properly. Oh. And, <laughs> and, and um, so this, my sculpture teacher was wonderful. He, nobody ever read to us as children, you know. And then when we had to play piano, we had to pick up our fingers properly. You know? And <laughs> so <laughs> I, he, he used to read stories to me uh, when I was smaller. And he would he, he send me out of the room and say, come back and look at your work. And see, uh, how, you know, pretend you're Mrs. Smith or what, Mrs. Jones or whatever, and criticize. Look at what Phyllis has done. It was wonderful training, of course, <laughs> and, and it was fun, you know. And, and so I think that uh, those were very formative, very important um, issues outside of you know other things that happened because of my family. But so so that that was, um, and so yes, I. I I guess I did that because I, got, I used to get a pain in my neck, literally, <laughs> as, as well as, uh, you know, ideally when I was playing the piano. <laughs> it, 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 sounds like, it sounds like you played a lot of piano. <laughs> no, I didn't. Oh. You know, nobody ever explained about the str Nobody explained anything. Oh. You just were supposed to sit down and put, pick your fingers up properly. There was no understanding of the length of the strings and the composition and the instrument you were playing. It was, so I just hated it. But it was my sculpture teacher, you know, I, I, we had clay, we, I had, you know, we, we kept it wet, we, you know, all, all the technical and, uh, and uh, craft things that you had to do. And I think that was always something I've been very interested in. How old were you when um, this was happening? Are we talking about like eight, nine or in high school? -ish? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. No, no. Young. I, I, have, I have little sculptures that say, uh, you know, Phyllis, age 11. <laughs> and I think there's one younger than that. Wow. Cat casts. So, uh, so that was a very important for you. And then you go to Vassar, right, for liberal arts. And then, at, but at that school in New York, were you studying sculpture at that school? No, but I, 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 I yes, I did. Um, first of all, I went to Cornell. Oh. Because uh, I couldn't get into Vassar. I didn't have great marks. And oh. I didn't know how to write those, you know, those, those, uh, Tests you had to say you had to choose a point. We had no. Uh, that was something I didn't know. So mm. I didn't have. But anyway, I transferred to Vassar because I wanted to go there. Oh, gotcha. And uh, and I, I, I liked the place somehow when I when I visited. 
And uh, so at, at Cornell, I started, I did, I took sculpture and there were architects there at architectural school. And so you used to work with the architectural school also. And it, it, at Cornell, it was excellent because we worked with very different uh, materials. It was much more modern. Mm. At Vassar, the sculpture and painting studios were very traditional, except that we did do, well, it's traditional too. We did do um, uh, frescoes and things like that. But, uh, but, but you know, that I, I, of course, that was wonderful. And, and then I took, um, <clears throat> I took, at Vassar, I took uh, an inter um, departmental degree because I, 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 I knew I was always going to be interested in art. And I, I took courses, of course, in art history, which were, were great. And uh, so, some of them very much related to later. And, but, but the, um, I, I, I guess at Vassar, the thing that was so terrific was you could just do anything. This was during the war. And um, I, I, it was, so there wasn't the kind of horrible pressure that came afterwards, well, let's say, mm. um, in the 60s and things like that, the 70s, of the high competition and all that. Mm. It, it was fairly, fairly relaxed. It just depended how you, you know, what you, how you gravitated. But I adored it because you could just try anything. Gotcha. For example, one course I took, uh, it was a course in English literature. And it was a wonderful course. I adored it. But um, you could do anything you wanted for uh, a paper. And so one of the people, uh, uh, one of the girls in the class was doing, we were re reading the, the um, Hawthorne, the Red Letter. And she, she, she was going to do a ballet. And I said, okay, I'll do the, the costumes for it. You know, I've never <laughs> done a costume in my life. But it, it was that kind of thing. Amazing. Was that your first time in New York or in the United States? Oh, no, 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 no. As uh, my father was back and forth always uh. Uh, from New York, as a major part of his business was in New York. Right. And, 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 and um, so we had houses in the, in, in the summer, uh, at, you know, in Long Island and, and various places. Uh, ever since I was a small child, I see. So and then we and then he had an apartment in New York, of course, mm -hmm. uh, at the St. Regis Hotel. So, so New York was. Uh, I remember in, in the St. Regis Hotel, looking out the window, and seeing these tiny toy cars way down below. <laughs> <laughs> they're still there. <laughs> yeah, they're still there. They're even smaller today. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Vassar, uh, what did you do after you graduated? Were you just practicing in sculpture, or...? I was brought up <clears throat> to the fact that, uh, well, I think my early life was just formed a lot of that stuff. Because I was like the second child, mm -hmm. and I was a girl. And my grandparents wrote to my, my, my paternal grandmother, said, Oh, it's a girl, but I hope she's going to be, it's great that she's going to be healthy. <laughs> and uh, so in our, my family, that uh, I, my father, you know, my sister was tall and lanky and supposedly very bright. And <laughs> okay. th then I had two younger brothers, mm -hmm. and that was for my father, heaven on earth. Mm. And so and, and he called me his pretty little daughter. So I had no, I, nobody paid attention to me much, you know. Mm. I used to sort of, um, I mean, I was, I was very much loved. I mean, there was, there was no problem. Emotionally, well, I relation to my father possibly, but 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 um, so 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 I was a kind of an outsider always hmm. in, in in relationship to that always in my in my childhood, and um, so so much of my so so you know this this position in the family, you know I I I I I was very much a loner. I I I, I used to I, I played with my brothers. I played football and stuff like that. But um, my sister was not that type of person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but 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 um, yeah. The kind of position in the family that you were speaking about has got to be, on the one hand, uh, difficult to to grasp when you're you're younger and you're coming up and you have aspirations. But at the same time, maybe potentially freeing. And I I, I was actually wondering, given that your father was such a successful businessman, business person, if there was any expectation for you to go more down that path as opposed to the arts, or was that not, not allowed? Uh, that's, where, that's where I started. Yeah, yeah, I forgot where I was going. Um, yeah, yeah, I was supposed to be, girls were supposed to be, marry rich men. Right. And so in the family fortune, 
the girls got 40 percent, 20 percent each, and then and, and the boys got 60 percent. Mm. <laughs> <Okay>? <laughs> yeah. Because we were supposed to marry, and, and uh, so that so was. Um, I, my dream was oh, I, I, my dream was to be an artist. Hmm. That's what I wanted to be, and that's what I loved. And I, you know, talk at the table, a lot of it about business and things like that, or money. And I just found that um, I sort of tuned out. <laughs> and um, so, so that, that sense of, you know, kind of being an outsider and, 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 and going my own way, mm-hmm. I, I, I think. I, I guess that's, that's partially the reason why, perhaps from your family's perspective, you doing art was part of it because you're kind of the, the odd person out so you can do your sculpture and do whatever because eventually you're going to marry <laughs> a nice wealthy person and then you'll be set and that's taken kind of, taken care of and have children and you know go on, go on like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so when i got out of Vassar, um i suppose i got married mm. I, it was a way of getting uh, uh, out of the family huh. i mean I, I it was i i i was painting and and sculpting at Vassar. And of course, doing the, the course, uh, other work, and uh, so I got married because that seemed like, <clears throat> and I married a Frenchman because that seemed like a good thing. And um, you know, my sister had always been very for the French, and coming working in Montreal, of course, mm-hmm. there, yeah, there's a wonderful sense of French culture, uh, and uh, there's also a, a difficult sense of French culture. But uh, you know, on the good side of it, I, I was kind of aware of it. And um, also, one thing that formed me very, very much was when, and, and I think this was the, I think it was my sculpture teacher, and the fact that I went where we lived, and when I walked to school every day, I walked in an area that was kind of mountainous with lots of trees and things like that. But what it was composed of were these long gray stone buildings that were. Uh, c- conventual mm. b- b- buildings, convents or f- schools of philosophy, religious buildings. And they had marvelous gardens with them. And, and one of them was called the Priest's Farm, which was, of course, <laughs> with the Suplicians, who were the founders of the island. And so there was this, I didn't know what it really meant at that point. But so the relationship of building, of these wonderful buildings, of wonderful materi- materiality, and w- connected completely to, to, to landscape, to these trees and to, and it wasn't a formalized, mm-hmm. as part of it was formal, but it wasn't like a French garden, you know, which, because it was part of a kind of nature of the part of the mountain, mm-hmm. because we lived at the at part of the mountain. And mm-hmm. so I think those are the two things that, as I think of it really now, uh, you know, had stood with me the rest of my life. And so uh, this is kind of a question jumping forward in a sense, but you've you were obviously born there, but you've re- you've stayed in, in Montreal. It seems like most of your life. I didn't. Oh no. I left. I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand. <laughs> it. I, <laughs> Why? I, I couldn't stand. No, no, no. I couldn't stand the separation, uh, and it was a separation of everything. I mean, a big separation between French and English, hmm. and as I was, you know, domestics were French. French Canadians, mm-hmm. and uh, so, and uh, they were considered lower class. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, I remember in this Anglican Protestant uh, Anglican school I went to, girls school, small school, when we got to the sixth form, uh, where we didn't have, we, we were almost graduating, we had fewer classes. I think we do sit around, and somebody would say, you know, who's classic or who's French? And I'd always put up my hand. Because it was just, of course, there was just, then they go on into all sorts of, how all the, you know, all that prejudice stuff. It was terrible. Mm-hmm. And, and since well, my family was Jewish, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and uh, there was a prejudice there too. And so, since my father was in whiskey, there was a prejudice there. <laughs> <laughs> right. The, 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 the distillation or distillery I'm company. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then that's happening all in like I don't know I guess the 1940s or 1930s. Yes, the right? 1940s exactly. Yeah. Well, no, 1930, 30s and 40s. Uh, 1937, I was 10, mm-hmm. and then in 1944, I went to to university. 
Wow. And so I went, I left. At that. I was so happy to get away. And, and actually, I always was that when I went to camp, I was just always so interested to, to be myself and see what was going on and things like that. I was never uh, you know, homesick. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I was delighted to be away. And so when I uh, w- went to, um, let's see, where was I? Yeah, so getting married mm. was a wonderful way. Uh, I, you know, your, your parents can no longer tell you what to do. It's really <laughs> ridiculous, but that was, that's the way things happen. Huh. So that was, that was fine, except I didn't. The life of the you know, my uh, the man I married was a businessman in, in investments and things like that, and um, I just thought all oh, that's so boring. And um, so after three years, um, you know, I started to dissolve the marriage. So that was that wasn't very long. And then you know th- there was there were periods in my life, and then I went to, to I went to France hmm. to to paint hmm. there i had a, a studio wonderful studio on the rochelle chair which overlooked the cemetery montparnasse it was quite quiet oh nice <laughs> it, was, it was it was wonderful and i had a lovely lover who uh, this is after my marriage dissolved uh, who 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 was just he, 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 everything all the culture was in his you know in his blood and um, his bones and so I traveled around and I painted. And then the situation, but I, I was I was restive. I was very, very restive. I wanted to do something. Hmm. What was I going to do? And, you know, as a painter, uh, that was not, you know, my paintings were okay, but I'd never gone to a school or, or, or mixed with painters after, after, after Vassar. Mm-hmm. So then the issue of the, of this, of the, Seagram building came up, and I, you know, my father was thinking about that for some time, and he, he, he talked to me about it. This is, you know, before I went to, 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 to Europe, and um, actually, when, 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 when I divorced and, and went to Europe, he said, "You're not divorcing your husband; you're divorcing the family." And I said, "Quite right." Wow! <laughs> wow! And I figured, wow. I figured out how I could live just a very modest amount mm-hmm. a year, and. and that was fine. I was just, you know, but then I was getting restive. I had to do something. What? I didn't quite know. And um, I, I had, uh, I guess at Vassar, I formed two friends who were wonderful. One was a very strong um, socialist, uh, Marxist, actually, hmm. and, and a brilliant woman. And the other was an a, a art historian. And she went on to take her uh, master's and her PhD at the Institute of Fine Arts. New York University, and I was living in New York. I mean, I left, as I said, I left Canada uh, and, and, and didn't return for 30 years. Oh, okay. So, so, so right after Vassar, did you live in New York City, like Manhattan or Brooklyn for a period of time? Before yeah, yeah. No, 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 Manhattan. Yeah. Manhattan. Who would live in Brooklyn? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Brooklyn's pretty hip these days. It's the new I know, I know, but then it was not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. Well, That's yeah, when the book yeah. was written, a tree grows in Brooklyn, you know? Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> Maybe at that time, Brooklyn was a different place. Um, and so, so you decide to, so when you were married, were you married like in New York City? That was a deal. And then you went to Paris afterwards. No, I was married here in Montreal. Oh, uh, Montreal. Oh, okay. okay, okay, gotcha. And then, then I lived in New York. So uh, why why the move to Paris? I mean, there's a lot of obvious reasons, I suppose, but uh, why not stay in New York City and try to Well, paint? because because my the man I was married to was French, mm. and so we, we went back and forth in those three years to France a lot. And uh, because of my background in Montreal, a, a great sympathy for things French, and where mm-hmm. else was I going to go? No, it was wonderful. And, 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 and British, British to me was, oh, you know, during the war, um, mm. Uh, refugees, fam- mm. yeah, families with children or children came to live in Canada and Montreal, and, and of course they looked down on us, mm. colonials. <laughs> right. So that, that wasn't something sympathetic to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, Paris and Paris, of course, Paris was the sense of culture. Mm. Um, you, you, I mean, that, that was it. Yeah, well, and, and I think Paris makes sense too if you're an artist, right? I mean, there's so much art, culture, uh, and it's probably a lot going on back then. Well, I didn't know about that. I just wanted to live. <laughs> <laughs> 
Gotcha. I went to live food. Mm -hmm. I was wild about food. When I was a child, you you were not allowed to have you know, um, condiments, and you had you know awful boiled beef, and oh, the food was terrible. And <laughs> so when I went to France and, and discovered this delicious food, I, it was great. I just, I just wanted to live, and I had this lovely lover, and it was wonderful. So how long were you in Paris? Well, I guess a couple of years, and then when I... I'm not exactly sure of the things. I I got. Well, I don't want to go through that. But anyway, um, then I, I I was quite restive, and this great friend of mine who was a art historian, hmm. uh, and I and uh, she was she, she she lived in Italy. She was in Rome. She was doing uh, uh, no, she was in Florence actually. But I joined her uh, in Rome uh, for Easter Easter time, and. Uh, we, you know, we, we, we traveled a lot and talked about architecture and art and things like that. And she said, and I started taking photographs. And she said, Phyllis, why don't you get off your duff and do something? <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, then I got this thing from my father. So, okay, fast forward, okay? Then, 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 uh, then, then my path was clear. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't see, I never saw, because of the background or because the very conservative background I came from mm -hmm. in Montreal, you know, girls got married, had children, went to the same school and all that sort of stuff. But nobody, there was no intellectual kind of environment. That's what I loved about Vassar also. Mm -hmm. But there was no, no, no uh, intellectual environment. And, and there was, um, you know, there, there, there was no sense of, of uh, being, a professional, being a professional at all. Right. Or, or doing, working, you know. Yeah. It was just, you know, I had married. And so uh, I, I guess it took me quite a while to sort of, sort of I don't say, well, I, I don't have to do that. I, you know, I can come out of that. But also, I do remember that I thought that a woman, as a woman, that I would be help, you know, the power behind the throne sort of thing, help, <laughs> right. uh, you know, direct things and things like that. Mm. And then I realized, you know, and, I, and then I wanted a strong man to protect me against my father, okay? Mm. <laughs> so, so since I realized that that wasn't going to work, I just said, okay, you're, you're you know, I, I just took over myself. Interesting. So, um, well, first of all, it sounds like your time in Paris was a dream. I think that's every person's aspiration at some point to live as a Westerner, to live in Paris for a few years, enjoy the food, the culture, have a, a fantastic lover and make art. Like, I, I would do that. That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you're there, and then... It's a, so your father, um, let me get this right, He's the he was the owner of the Seagram Company. Is that right? That's right. He right. Cre he cre yeah. Yeah. So you're in Paris, and he has this idea of doing a new headquarters that's going to be located in New York City. That was... Well, yeah, because that's the, where you know, all the... Like Seagram's was at the top of the line by then. You know, it was the biggest, it was very, it was, it was its, you know, sort of top, top, top period. Mm -hmm. And it was after the war, and there was this great sense of you could do anything, you know. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I always think of the fact that, you know, to analyze um, how, uh, music halls, you would use Schlieren diagrams, which is you, you, you use smoke into a model and see how it curled. And, and mm -hmm. then you could you could see the clouds to get rain. I mean, that was everything you could do, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I felt that way too, but <laughs> uh, I had to find out what that was. But and and um, so that you know, I, I think that from the prejudice background he came from, he also wanted to establish a, a, a kind of a legacy, and that's mm -hmm. why boys were important and girls weren't. Okay, mm -hmm. so so so. So that he wanted to do a building in New York. In, in Montreal, the, he had, there was a quite nice building, as I look at it now. It was um, a, a little Scottish um, greystone um, castle, you know. And because when he was starting off in, uh, in being in, 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 in whiskey, he, he went to Scotland and he, he managed to find the very top people there and, and he uh, learned from them. And so, that, you know, he adored it. He adored Scotland, and so he had this. But it was a very, it's a very nice little building. But I thought, of course, it was ridiculous. <laughs> this little Scottish castle. <laughs> and, 
So, uh, uh, and I, I was, you know, but anyway, so things went along, and because it was for the 75th anniversary of the creation of Seagram, mm -hmm. he didn't create the name, I mean, the company, but he bought it mm -hmm. in 27, I think. And I think it went just when I was about born. And he, um, so then he, he he didn't do, pay much attention to what was happening, but he wanted a building. And so his chief, um, the, the strongest salesman he had was in the Seagram company, Seagram 7, it was a big mark. And so he was went out to sort of find an architect, the, the, you know, the executive committee of the... Uh, and so he, at that time, this was very funny, uh, the, the Seagram house, the, the Sleever house had been built. I mean, a later, 51, I guess. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, and I, I'm not sure of the date. So, yeah, 51, I think. And um, so he uh, became friendly with the man who was running it, who happened to be Charles Luckman, who had to be trained, uh, happened to be trained as an architect. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was, I, I knew I had met Charles Luckman, Oh really? On on on, on a, when I first went to Europe after graduation, I went to Europe with my parents, and um, I, and I remember on the deck there was this man who kind of was making eyes at me and things like that, and his name was Charles Luckman. I thought he was pretty creepy, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I, I knew he was awful. And the building, mm -hmm. was, I mean, you can't. I just don't want to even say it. it. Makes me sick to even think of it. It was so dreadful, and it would have happened because you know it was just a model he was making for a big um, a company a reunion from people from all over. But um, it, it would have just gone ahead. Yeah. And and so my father said I was living still in Paris. My father said, um, and I had seen him in, in Rome when I was there. I was talking about, to him about Michelangelo and walking around with him. And so he sent me uh, a image of this thing. And, you know, that, I just, it shocked me into emotion. And, and, and so I went to London to speak to, um, oh, what is his name? He was the Dean of uh, Architectural Historians at that time um i, I just he, he, he was actually european but and and so he said why don't you become an architect i said, I don't have time so, <laughs> uh, and anyway I, I i immediately started reading everything i could and then i there was a, bi a big uh, thing about my father said well you can come back and choose the the, the uh, materials for the building or something like that i i said you don't have a daughter you know, I'm not doing that. And um, so my mother finally said to my father, you know, dearie, she might be able to do something. So anyway, I came back and I became the, I, I was so intent, so absolutely focused on this. This, you know, I'd always been very strong about art and very intent about it, but this focused me so completely. And I just knew what was right. I want to and, ask uh, you, I want to ask you, so, so you're in Paris and, and, you know, there's some kind of tension between you and your father, but you guys are still obviously in connection and speaking to each, with each other. And he shares with you an image of this building, which I, I'm I tried to find online. I can't, I couldn't find an image of the original design. Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, if, if you look at my, if you look at my book, Building Seagram, I think you'll find it. Okay. okay. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> he sends you an image of this building. And you have a a quite visceral response to this thing. Um, I mean, you really don't like it, and and I know you don't want to even think about the building. But so, what what was it about it that really? It was so vulgar. It was so it was so vulgar, and I knew a little bit about what was happening in, in the world. And you know, this was a period of the great architects. There was Mies. Mm -hmm. There was Le Corbusier. Mm -hmm. There was uh, 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 the guy who did the Bauhaus, and I mean. And there were good people like Breuer. I mean, there were just, it was amazing. There was a person by the name of Robson who did a building in, in Paris, which was a modern building, which I thought was really interesting, you know? And so this piece of vulgarity uh, was just, um, it, it wasn't architecture. It was, I can't tell you what it was. It was just a commercial bottle. It was awful. And, uh, and, and so 
I, I wrote to my father and I said, you know, if you're going to build a building, you have a responsibility. You have responsibility not only to the people who work in it, but you have responsibility to the people who come by the building, and you have responsibility to the area that the building is in, and you have responsibility to the city, you have responsibility to the world. I said, otherwise, you can do nothing and, and, and just rent. But if you're going to build a building, you must do the best that you can. So uh, eventually, then he said to me, so I went to see uh, Alfred Barr at um, the Museum of Modern Art because the person who was his assistant secretary had, I knew from Vassar. Hmm. And uh, so she said, come and, see, uh, come and see Arthur. So I went to see uh, uh, Alfred, I'm sorry. I went to see Alfred, and Alfred said, well, you know, go and see Philip Johnson, but remember, he uh, is leaving the museum because he was the head of the design uh, uh, department, and he's, he's going to, and his, he already had a firm, small firm, and so he said, okay, okay. So anyway, from there, I, I uh, uh, then my father wanted me to, I, I told, I showed him a book on Mesa. I showed him photographs of the, <laughs> of the Barcelona pavilion. I said, "Isn't that just wonderful?" He said, "I don't understand." <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my mother said, "Look, just don't talk about architecture again." With <laughs> well, so that's the interesting thing is that, um, despite this kind of relationship with her father, you know, you you spoke so so passionately about the 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 negatives of the initial proposal and you were so invested in, in trying to make sure this building turned out to be something as you described it should be i'm kind Resolving? of curious like how, well how did you i mean i'm kind of curious like going from saying you know you know uh, you know you should be marrying a husband that's what you should be doing to okay here's the responsibility of being the i guess planning director or whatever title for this seagram, seagram building seems like a that's a huge responsibility to take I think, well, I didn't think about that at all. Mm. To me, there was just one thing to do the right building. The, 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 the greatest architects that had existed since the, the Renaissance, and uh, these are the people. What, the, 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 they should be, one of these people should be doing the building. And so, uh, you know, I think that my father, I think there were two things. He wanted to get me back to Canada, to, to New York or to the, to North America anyway. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, but I, he saw in me the fire that he himself had had in building the company. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that didn't exist in my brothers. You know, they were guys, and that was, you know, the way guys are. So um, he saw that kind of fire. And then he sent me off to see um, the head of the Fuller Company, which is, Mies used to say, the Fuller Company was uh, like, like, um, Walgreens um, uh, drugstores. You saw it on every corner, everywhere. I mean, they were the biggest con con construction company. Mm. And, then, and so I went to see uh, the, the head of it, and we got on like a house on fire. You know, he, and so my father, they were going to, he had suggested that they have a clerk of the works who, you know, was managing the whole thing, and uh, some oh, tired old guy who had gone to, who, 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 who built the library in Washington, and oof, he, 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 all he could think of were uh, oriental rugs. I think that oriental rugs are nice now, but at that point I thought, oh, this is just uh, mm -hmm. ter terrible. Anyway, uh, and so he, uh, the, the head of the company said that I should be the one to choose the architect. So. Oh. So how did you approach on going about finding the architect for this building? Oh, well, of course, I spoke to Philip Johnson, and I spoke to a friend of mine who was, um, <coughs> had, uh, knew Lewis, Lewis Mumford. I spoke to him first, you know, before anybody, before mm -hmm. I even saw, saw, saw um, I went to the Museum of Modern Art. And, uh, you know, I, I knew who was around. And so, you know, when you say to somebody, I want to talk to you about uh, building a great building in New York. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Oh, yeah, I'd love to talk to you about that. What do you want, you want to know? Are you hiring? Do you need an architect? Um, but was the list limited? Like, were you looking for someone who had done a tall building like that before? Or were you considering an architect that maybe did not? No, 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 no. We, 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 we didn't do it that way. We uh, talk, talked about who, okay, the, I guess the best... We, we, you know, we still talked about things, but very quickly, uh, Errol Saarinen and his wife, Aline, came out to Philip Johnson's house 
in 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 Ukrainian, and and uh, I was I, I was there that weekend. Okay, and we were, we were pro it was a purposeful discussion. Philip had put this together so that we could discuss, you know, how to go about doing finding an architect, mm -hmm. and um, so. Arrow adored making lists. He was a great <laughs> list maker. So there were those who could and should. There were those who could and shouldn't. And those were th there were those who should but couldn't. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, and in, in in you know so all the younger people, uh, I guess Arrow was in the list eventually of those who uh, should but couldn't because they were sort of not the second generation. Of decent architects, but not the great architects. Mm -hmm. Of course, he wouldn't have thought that. Thought that. <laughs> anyway, so well, he did make a pitch for something else in New York. Did he pitch for New York? No, he didn't. But anyway, then uh, yeah, maybe he did. Anyway, the um, so then I decided to go and uh, so I, to, to to see those who could, who should but couldn't. Mm -hmm. And those, of course, those who could but should were such a small list. Mm -hmm. that it mm -hmm. Was Mies? It was uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. and it was um, it was um, Le Corbusier. Mm -hmm. Well, Frank Lloyd Wright was in the picture somewhere because my uncle somehow knew his daughter was a movie. anyway. So and and he 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 wrote and said that he I'll build to my father. He said, "I'll build you the tallest." building in the world, you know, right. and, and my father said, I don't want to meet, I meet my maker so soon. <laughs> but, but, but that, anyway, that must have uh, been at the tail end, because Wright was, came a little bit before uh, Mies and Cabruzier, so Wright must have been at the very end of his, I guess. Yeah, he was, he, that was, uh, he was actually doing the Guggenheim at that time. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if he was in 54 already. Yeah, I think he was, because I went over when you know during the years when we worked on the Seagram building, I went over to see him with Philip, hmm. because Philip had you know they, they had not had some very good relationships, and he invited Philip over, and Philip said, "Oh, I'm terrified. Come with me." So I said, "Sure." <laughs> so <laughs> so that, I, I, I do kind of have to ask because obviously we are of a certain generation and we know all of these people, but only through basically history courses and readings online and documentaries and stuff, you know, at that time when you're meeting with Frank Lord Wright, Philip Johnson, Mies, and, and whoever else, did, I mean, and this was, and for Mies, this was like at the height of his influence, I, I feel like, right? No, it wasn't. It, it wasn't. It, it wasn't. wasn't. No. <clears throat> but Mies? this was after the Barcelona Pavilion. No. Well, but that was so different. Mm. Barcelona Pavilion was one thing. That was great. But he was in America. Mm-hmm. And he was at IIT, and he was in Chicago, okay? And he had done, you know, he'd done the campus for IIT and, and a few buildings, brick and, and, um, and um, steel and glass. And you don't make a building in New York out of that, mm. you know? And uh, <laughs> he, had, he had actually done the 860 Lakeshore Drive. And that was in 1851 that he, he had, had done that. Mm. And... So, but anyway, that comes later. I'll, I'll get to him in a second. But, but so anyway, uh, we had, and so I, I also the head of the Fuller Company wanted me to go and see these people that had these big firms, you know. So I did, and they were horrible, of course. That was. <laughs> but I went, uh, I, my, I, I went to see everybody in their own studios, in their own offices. Right. Because how else do you, you don't know what anybody if you sit down and talk to them in, in a cocktail party some somewhere. So I went. I went to all the offices of those people and wrote down what I ha happened and and or, or spoke to, spoke a, 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 into a little you know um, uh, speaker, uh, whatever you call those things. And then um, at the end, I went to see Phil uh, Mies. At the end, I never went to see Le Corbusier hmm. because I, my, my question was okay. The question I I never asked anybody if they want to do the building. You know, a ridiculous question. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I'm okay. I, I, I don't need to do an iconic <laughs> building on Park Avenue <laughs> for a giant corporation. It's, you know, um, <laughs> I don't need that. <laughs> but I asked them, what do you think a building in New York 
an office building in New York should be? That's a good who question. do you think should be doing it? Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, any, anyway, um, Le Corbus, when I went to see Mies, uh, you know, Ira talked about all sorts of stuff. I went to see him, and I went to see, of course, the, the General Motors thing that he had done, which was very Miesian, okay? Mm-hmm. And everybody talked in terms of Mies. I would do this differently than Mies, and that differently than Mies. Really? But it was always Mies. And so when I met Mies, and uh, people had said to me about the Corbus, I said, I said, well, anyone asked people, well, what about the Corbus? Say, oh, he, you know, he's French, he doesn't know the, how to build. Well, he's, he was working in New York then, but the, 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 be that as it may. And um, so when I asked Mies about Le Corbusier, he said, of course you should. He's a wonderful artist. <laughs> he was so generous, and there was such an aura about him. And I went to see the um, 860 Lakeshore Drive, and I was just, you know, it just hit me like that. It was so wonderful. Mm. This, 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 this very severe group of buildings, two buildings, but not severe, so gentle mm-hmm. at the same time. And, you know, just so cl- clear, that was so so beautiful. So uh, I think I said somewhere, uh, you know, there's a sort of ugliness, but superb uh, beauty, and great beauty in the ugliness. Anyway, hmm. um, then I went back to New York, reported to the head of the Fuller Company, and he said he thought that Mies was quite doable. And uh, then he asked me, since Mies was 75 then, I said, oh, well, what happens if Mies, you know, disappears during the time? Mm-hmm. And I said, I had no idea. And he said, what about Philip? So I thought, well, Philip, you know, Philip was connected to New York. I wasn't connected to New York. I mean, I, 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 my connection to New York was what I was doing. And, but I didn't have any real roots in New York. Mm-hmm. And uh, my father really didn't. Uh, why my father? No, I was going to say that. But um, you know, Mies didn't either, of course. Mm-hmm. And um, he, you know, he and so I. I um, so, so anyway, I thought that Philip would be good because you know Philip was wonderfully social and mm-hmm. uh, very suave and <laughs> very brilliant and you know all these things. And he was fun. And you know, Mies didn't talk a lot either. Really? So. So uh, anyway, then uh, Mies came to meet my father, and they immediately respected each other. Hmm. He came to the, the St. Regis apartment that my parents had. My mother was there, and she spoke a little bit of German. And um, so they, uh, anyway, they just absolutely, completely respected each other. So anyway, that's a, that, that, that was a uh, an extraordinary period in my life. But I didn't, you know, I didn't try to... T- you know, I'd go to exhibition openings at the Museum of Modern Art, and, uh, you know, uh, Daisy, Daisy Barr, sort of friend. And, but but I just was living my life that I lived, and, and I didn't try to sort of enter into the art art center of, of life. Of people, you know, I did get to know some of the artists, but I, what was I doing? I was working on, 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 the, on the building. I was making sure. I had my office at the same place that, um, in the same place that Philip uh, had set up the office for Mason himself. Mm. And um, so. Well, I was going to ask you. Um, oh, yeah. And so, and so I, 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 I felt that my. I, oh, yes. I stayed on. I was going to go back to Paris, okay? Ah. But I stayed on because of the. I realized that the. Um, that if, I, if the person who really cared about this didn't stay on, Mies would never get that building done. And, you know, for example, <laughs> Lou Kahn, uh, not Lou Kahn, uh, oof, why do I say that? Uh, Kahn and Jacobs mm-hmm. were the uh, associate architects because the head of the Fuller Company said they were good builders. Okay, yeah. And so uh, Kahn himself, at one point, you know, when Mies had done the model, things like that, uh, said, well, you know, this building is... Um, you know, it's ridiculous, this building with, you know, a chunk out of it like that. Make a nice four by five building. And mm-hmm. I went down to his office and I went, bang on his desk. I said, <laughs> you were not asked to design the building. And so there was a big, huge conference. It was 
set up uh, with um, all, PMO, the Building Managers Association, mm -hmm. uh, who had been, and, and you know, there's, there's a photograph of me with thousands of pairs of ears around me, not thousands, but a table full of men. There was one woman who was taking the notes and one other woman. And at that, uh, so we were all terrified. Mies was about to go back to Chicago. Philip was going to go where I don't know. We were all just going to di disappear. We were all, you know, so upset about this. Mm. And of course, the people said the building was wonderful. <laughs> and so that was the end of that. But there, there, and then there, the, 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 the clerk of the works guy and the head of the building committee were, didn't like me. So, you know, they didn't like it, this thing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there was all this. I, I was there trying to make sure that Mies could do the building he wanted to do without all this interruption. So that's what I did. So I guess, I guess what I was really doing was what I thought earlier of the woman <laughs> who was making things possible for something to happen, you know? Right. I, I see. And I, I see. And, I, and I guess in a way, that's what I always have done. I mean, me creating the, 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 the CCA. You know, I'm not designing a building. I, mean, I was involved in what the building would be, all, all that, and very much in, involved in, 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 what, you know, in, in choices of architecture and stuff like that. But I was never the architect. I had been an architect. I did, I did, but I was more interested in seeing, you know, as an architect, I could do one building. But if I worked with other people, I, then we could do many, many more things. And, and so, um, you know, so, 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 so I always, I guess, as a position of the CCA, it was a place where people could do so many things. They could learn so much. There could be uh, people learning, people reading, you know, so exhibitions, of ideas, a center of ideas of, of, of what the issues were. You know, so um, I, I guess in a way that's the sort of third part of my, my existence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really fascinating because, uh, you know, I think like what it says online is you were, the title was director of planning or something like this for the Seagram building. And I had always wondered, like, what does that, what does that mean exactly <laughs> in the role with all the different people? But as you described, I guess it's kind of a defender uh, uh, to preserve like the artistic vision, but also to make sure things get done. Well, it was, it was to squash all those. Um, I mean, there were many fights, there were many. Uh, difficulties and, and you know at the end towards the end they were laying actually the building was pretty well up they were laying the uh, travertine in the plaza and uh, the building had not rented as well as my father had hoped it would be so somebody came to him with the idea of putting banks where the plaza was <laughs> Mm -hmm. And so that was brought up in, 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 in the pub, because we had meetings every week of, you know, the contractors, the, uh, the engineers of different types, the various architects, and the, 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 the firm that was going to rent out the building, renting the building. So uh, when they brought that up, I said, no, you know, no question, simply no question. So then it was brought to my father. And Philip even went. Uh, he even asked Philip. And Philip said, he, "He said, don't, 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 don't tell Phyllis, don't tell Phyllis." <laughs> and anyway, finally, finally, Phyllis got into it. And um, uh, with me, with me, we went out to see my father in in, in, in Terrytown, where he had a, a, a house, uh, a country house. Mm -hmm. Well, it was a house house where he uh, when he was in New York, and. Um, Mies, my father, we sat in the garden, and my father said to Mies, Mies, what do you think? And he said, if I were you, Mr. Bromfen, I would not do that. And that was the end of it. <laughs> a, a person of few words. <laughs> yeah, but my father understood. You see. Yeah. And, he, and he, he had, of course, asked lots of uh, people. And Philip, I think, is, I guess had done a study to show that the income from, you know, the cost of the extra building and the income uh, you know, would not be so sensational. So, uh, you had mentioned that, you know, throughout the, throughout the process, there are a number of challenges and, you know, your role being to kind of take care of them. Um, it, were there more challenges because of the design of the building? It, because it appeared to be too strange oh, to I the... Don't know. It's, uh, well, I mean, you know, uh, people didn't understand. Mm. People didn't understand. And 
I mean, Con and Jacobs didn't understand. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they, they were so wedded to the New York way of doing things. I mean, everybody was all in their own little silos of what you do, and, and, and there was no imagination. You know, that's a real problem, yeah. you know, always. And so, also, there were problems in, in, in um, bidding and in, 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 in contracting the building. Because I opened the, uh, the, 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 I was there when the bids were opened, and um, um, the there were people who people thought because they supplied Seagram with something or else they'd have preferential. I kept all that away. I stopped him. <laughs> I wouldn't let it happen. Right. You know, I just I said no, no, no. So um, yeah, it was it was just a lot of that stuff. How challenging was it to be in that position? Because uh, essentially, you're the client, right? So, and and in some regards, you have all the power to a certain degree. Uh, but I don't. I didn't think. That, I didn't think that way. I right. just thought, what is it? Well, how can we make this building work? How can we get this building done? Uh, how challenging was it to you know accomplish that task and all the different challenges? You know, as a female during that time, I can't imagine, right? Well, out of all of the construction people and the different, all the people and directors and whoever's involved, that there's a lot of women in positions of authority <laughs> they were able to well, converse with. You know, I guess the thing was, my father never gave me the job. Never. Huh. Luke Condo said she should do it. Hmm. But, um, you know, if I find the architect, and then, then, then there was a young man who was my father, who was assistant to my father. He never had an assistant, but he did at this point. And the young man completely understood what I was up to. And all the other executives, all the executives were completely against it. Who is this guy, this childish man? They never heard of him. You know, yeah. it, was, it was awful. And um, he, he sort of said to me, you have to be on the building committee. And he said, take a deep breath. I mean, I was... A, very, very private person, and I'd never done anything like this before. Hmm. And so it was, it was very helpful for him to say that, you know, just go in and, and do it. So I did. I just went into a meeting. I said, I want to be on the building committee. <laughs> they couldn't say no because I was the boss's daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, and so I, I don't know what was, in pe- what was in people's heads when I was there, but they knew that I... I, I guess they knew that uh, I wielded some power. I didn't. I didn't think of myself that way. Mm-hmm. I didn't think of power at all. I didn't think I was telling them what to do. I mean, I was protecting this building. I, I was making its conditions that Mies could do the building he wanted to do, mm-hmm. and everything else passed. You know, it's like when you're working on something. I'm working. I'm working on a book now, and, uh, and so you have to get. So, so everything else disappears. You're just working on that thing. Everything else in the world just it doesn't exist. And that's how I was. I mean, I'm I'm thinking in my head how many, how many more great buildings and great architectures and public spaces and everything else would exist if every project had a person had a, oh. a, a Phyllis on it when it was <laughs> happening. Because you actually outline uh, the description of the challenges of the Seagram building. I'm sure there are a lot of specific ones specific to it, but a lot of it also does sound very familiar to a lot of big projects, right? There's all these different forces at play, and the architect a lot of times ends up being the person to try and be both designer and all the architect stuff, and also the one to negotiate and navigate the the kind of conflicts and challenges that you mentioned. And it's it's difficult. Well, it was it was, it was a lucky set of circumstances. Mm. You know, it was lucky that my father. Was doing this. Luckily, he, he listened to me. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, sure, there are all these circumstances, but you know, uh, I, I don't know how many uh, other fathers would do that. It, it was his sense of dynasty. I think that that made him. Everything else went out of the way, you know. And um, and and, and Mies, um, you know, and his respect for me and and Mies's respect for him. You know, we were in a meeting once when. All the executives and second level executives, big meeting about what should happen on the plaza. And so there were people saying this, and there were people saying that. And I said, This is ridiculous, you know. <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, this plaza 
it, it, it's just, it, it'll be able to, all sorts of events will happen on the plaza, but what, what, what the architecture of it is, what the design of it is, is the essence of things. And so I think I it sort of said to my father, you know, forget it, and in front of everybody. And, but he took it, you know? Wow. I mean, it was just, I was completely fearless. Yeah. I mean, because it wasn't fearless. It was just, I knew what had to happen. I knew it was ridiculous, you know? Right. It, it's really interesting to me that um, a a that the project itself um, for any, for any project, but like the, the work itself becomes kind of like the guiding factor. That is the focus. That is the thing that's driving the the way that the, what you have to do. And in a certain sense, like the politics that are at play, certainly especially at that time, are far far secondary to what the primary you know objective is, yes. and that is yes. to make the building what it wants to be. Yes, yeah, like the zoning issue. Of course, mm. it created great problems afterwards, but she <laughs> did not, not fill the envelope. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, 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 uh, what she did was to build, uh, you know, you have a lot in this, so you know, can go so high with, it, uh, uh, with the elevator, so that in a way, uh, because it's a given building, uh, it gives you how many square feet you'll do. And that was the basis of it. And it was, and, and, and because my father didn't want a building just like the like lever just for lever mm -hmm. he wanted a building that would, they were rental that would, had income so you know th th that was but then you know if we could it could have been twice as big you couldn't do that now everybody would say oh there's zoning and the possibility you built a ride you right. know um i was also wondering just what was it like to work with mies van der Rohe, and was he because you, your your passion for architecture obviously continued after this project, right? Was he kind of like a mentor? Was there a lot of design discussion with you, or how how what was that like? Well, yeah, he was a mentor, but in, in a way, he sat <clears throat> he sat in his office. We had, we had these little cubicles that were you know in a bigger space. You know, Philip right against the windows that Philip had designed, <laughs> and so I had a cubicle. We all had the same size cubicle. And so he'd sit in his cubicle smoking his cigar. <laughs> and, and then he'd come out and, you know, uh, he, he'd discuss this or that with the other people. And I, you know, I'd, I'd listen and I'd ask questions. And um, I remember I once wanted to help making a model. It was just a model of the ground floor of, uh, of the, um, uh, it was when there was a question about what would be on the ground floor. Hmm. And, uh, you know, where the restaurants are. And so I wanted to help her do the model. And he said it was, thought it was not a good idea for me to, <laughs> to do that. Obviously, <laughs> I can see everybody knows there's our team, they know what to do. But anyway, I, 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 I was a sculptor. I knew how to, I was good with my hands, you know. <laughs> but, uh, and he, he would stay all night with everybody. Hmm. And, and then he would, you, you know, we would discuss things. He would, uh, you know, I was there always when there was a discussion about the, the, the bronze mullions and the thickness of them and the steps and I mean all all these design issues. So I I I, I learned a great deal. It was wonderful. You know, Mies, Mies was a person. He would never say anything bad about anybody, huh. and he he was very ferocious about. You know, for example, I remember when in his office, uh, Myron Goldsmith. You know, went to see uh, to to Skidmore, and so somebody is saying something bad about Skidmore. And he said, "You mustn't say that." He has to be loyal to the people he works with. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just mm -hmm. he, he was amazing that way. But the discussions uh, were well. We we'd go we go to lunch pretty well every day together. Philip, myself, and and Mies. Mies would have a couple of martinis, not I. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, That's because and, you're uh, director of planning. You need to make sure that he gets back to work. <laughs> no, no. I, that, that wasn't my yeah. <laughs> role at all. <laughs> Never thought of such a thing. Yeah. But we, the, um, and he'd tell a story about the Bauhaus and, uh, you know, setting up the, the problems of setting up the Barcelona Pavilion and the last, I mean, all, all these stories, they were wonderful. I mean, it, it, it is kind of, it, it does blow my mind, I frankly, know. <laughs> and frankly uh, it does blow my mind. Um, <clears throat> but it's also kind of, I have to say, kind of a, almost heartwarming to hear that um, the, the three of you were in kind of one space and that it wasn't a toxic environment for you to be in. 
you know, uh, that you were able to converse with them and, and like, so they didn't, you know, have any issues with basically having a woman you know, alongside with them. I never thought of that, you, you know, know? Um, I, you know, my, I lived, I guess that most of my friends were men mm -hmm. going to architectural school, of course. Mm -hmm. there were, how many girls were there at the architectural school? Like one percent of the class anyway. yeah and and, um, and and also all the girls i knew at that time except for my two very good friends uh you know were, weren't doing anything you know they were not like not like now and so uh, just for all, all my friends were men and i never i never thought of the men woman thing you know mm -hmm. so even when i was doing the building yeah. that, that i did afterwards at the safety bronfman center and i was on the site when they were starting to pour the concrete on the main floor, uh, uh, over the uh, you know the rebars, and uh, and I saw that the stairs to the lower level were turned the wrong way, you know. So I said, eh, it and but the, the the people used to laugh at me. The men used to say, you know, taking pictures, taking a picture of me, you know. <laughs> so you got that all the time. And I, when I formed a partnership with Gene Summers who had been Mises' right-hand man for uh, 17 years. And he, 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 like all people had to do, or had any real t talent, he had, to, he had to do his own thing. So he, uh, and um, when we were doing uh, the, the Biltmore Hotel in, 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 in Los Angeles, and we, you know, we meet people, everybody thought I was his secretary. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 of course. I'm curious from the whole Seagram process, what was, what would you say is like the one thing that you learned the most from, or learned the most about from that process? I'm not sure what to say. I mean, to me, I guess, well, for the Seagram building, you know, my, as I said, my, my sense of it was that it had to be such an important part of the city hmm. and, and the plaza. No, no, nobody ever talked about that, but that was the most important part of it. Mm -hmm. And you know, somebody said to me, you know, what about if it had been steel? You know, he said, was, the bronze doesn't make any difference. It'd be just as good as steel, which is right. Mm -hmm. um, but the, um, I guess it reinforced my sense of land. I learned a lot about, oh, I learned a lot about how people people in business how people work how people mm. uh in, in, in how, how in architecture in the, the process and um i guess it also the the totality of the thing the thing as a as a um a what is that german word the, you know complete work of art mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, you know when when um I, in my little office, I didn't always have something uh, uh, to do. So, I, I, and, and I was so wonder, well, interested in drawing. So, I had a little drawing table and a little T square, and I did these hyperbolic paraboloids. I even went on vacation with my table to try different kinds of hyperbolic paraboloids. <laughs> and so, 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 you asked me about you know the process of my own office when I was doing work. Excuse me. You know what, what? What? What did? How did I approach? Well, I think that always this idea from starting from, you know, the, the, that I learned from me so deeply, but um, starting from the facts, hmm. you know, was well, that, that, that was just so so basic, and and but I always worked completely, you know, myself. I I I, I, I as, as I said I, earlier, this you know, this sense of craft in the sense of doing things I, I never had an office in which there was more one person outside of myself <laughs> so so um I, you know i always went to meetings alone but i i had i had an assuredness i guess about that and then i guess the experience with seagram made it possible for me to work with gene also on the on the on the biltmore hotel well we we did this um that, that was an important uh, project because it was the very first hotel 
run renovation in, 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 in North America. Mm -hmm. A major hotel, I think. And, you know, that, that was the time when everything was coming down. And uh, at the same time, it was very much a part of the whole uh, area of Chicago, which is called Something Hill, that, that uh, you, you know, it was uh, part of it was black population, and, and part of it was uh, deteriorating, and part of it was torn down. And so the integration of the, the building, the old building, and, 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 and bringing it back to something not as it was necessarily, mm -hmm. but just to the quality, you know, mm -hmm. and, and to the, 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 the landscape around it, you know, that was really important. If that hadn't happened, it would be a very different place. So I, I, I guess, you know, the working on the Seacombe building, uh, subliminally somewhere, there was an understanding of how, how, how things happen and, and what happens. Working in Egypt, for example, uh, you know, I, I was always this, it was always the project. There's never, you know, there's never any deference to a somebody because of their position or something like that. Mm -hmm. There was always the, the sense of the necessity of the thing itself and what mm -hmm. it had to represent. And that re representation was always something much broader, broader than the thing itself. Mm -hmm. I, I guess, I guess. If I hadn't done, been involved in Seagram's, maybe I wouldn't have had such a, maybe I wouldn't have had that sense. I don't know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it seemed like even before the Seagram building happened or that it's, the project started, you kind of had a, a sense of what the responsibility of architecture is. I mean, actually, you know, in your letter to your father, as you described it, it's description of architecture being this thing that's you know, essentially for the public and, and, and whatever else is, uh, is totally accurate. Um, do you have a sense of where that philosophy comes from for you? Was it because of your time in Paris or because of something else? I'm time in Paris, not at all. Hmm. In Montreal, you know, Montreal, when I was growing up, there were some wonderful buildings and, and uh, where I lived and, and the circumscribed area I was allowed to go to, <laughs> right. you know, was, was, uh, the, was a f fine, fine quality of things. I think that, you know, my learning, my, my, my advisor, you know, the, the, the courses I took and the, the, the intellectual level learning of the history of things, that this was all very important. And it was important in, you know, in, uh, in, 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 in Seagram, it just didn't, terms of the place and, and, and the I'd taken courses at the I was taking courses all the time when I was doing Seagram at the Institute of Fine Art in New York, New York University mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in architectural history with Krautheimer and with other people and so you know and, and so the sense of of essence of what architecture could be was so deeply in me and so I think that that drove everything, and uh, so you learn you learn how to you learn how to navigate, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But um, and I guess you as you go along, that sense of what art can be, what mm -hmm. ar architecture as a totality can be. Um, mm -hmm. You know that you you, you learn you, you learn more about it. You, you grow with it. You know. Yeah. I mean, it's not something that's just always there. It's always there, sure, under underlying everything. But that, you know, that's a, it, it develops. It develops as you work. Yeah. It's almost like the Seagram Building was sort of like a proof of concept of of not proof of proof of concept, but proof of I guess way of thinking or or way of working and whatnot. And it's kind of funny because it just occurred to me, I guess the Seagram building was like your first architecture that you worked on. You just want to have a building as your first project. <laughs> That's not a bad start. Not so bad. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so the, when it's completed, right, and, and people move in, it's lauded and it's praised for being as remarkable as it is. And it ends up being, even in decades later, is highly influential and important. Um, but so what happens for you after the project is completed? Well, then I 
um, yeah, I went. I went to school. I went to Yale. <laughs> Uh, to study architecture I, specifically. I, 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 because I wanted to be an architect, yeah. Right. <laughs> well, as I said in, in my office at, when I was working, um, you know, uh, at Seacombe Building, I was doing my, you know, drawing drawings, my hyperbolic paraboloids. <laughs> I just loved them because there were so many, uh, you know, uh, parameters, permutations, and things that you could do with them. You were at Yale, but you didn't stay there for very long. You ended up transferring? I, I stayed there for two years, I oh, guess. Okay. And uh, maybe yeah, obviously two years. Well, the thing that bothered me at Yale was that I wasn't learning what I wanted to learn. The, the discussion was: should there be a campanile at the end of a campus, sort of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And and there was a lot of posturing and radiolarens and you know <laughs> theory that you know young people were sort of um, uh, putting forth and uh, sort of pretension, I think, possibly. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I wanted to learn what a two but four was. <laughs> 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 so uh, I, what, I was doing a project. We had a project of school for uh, children who had um, Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. And um, I i done. I, I did a kind of loose con scheme for it, <laughs> and you know, so, and and I, I didn't like it, and so I didn't finish it. So I had to make it make that up over the summer, and um, so I decided to go to work in Mises' office, and because that's where. I, and and I, I said if, if I you know had Mises my. Professor over the summer said, "Okay." Then, you know. mm -hmm. So, but I worked there. I I I, I worked for uh, on a project there. And I was it that maybe I what I did at one point. But maybe that time I worked on a on a school. That's right. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot from me because he'd come by my table. <laughs> Wait, was his office? Where was his office located? In Chicago. Chicago. Oh yeah. What am I thinking? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. yeah on Ohio Street. And then. Um, then I went uh, and so then I w saw the drawings that people did at uh, IIT. He's got full scale drawings of, of sections of a building. And I thought, oh boy, those were so beautiful. And uh, so I went to IIT. Now I think there was something wrong in that education too. I mean, I learned as I did at the school, that nice Anglican school I went to in Montreal, <laughs> that, uh, that, that that ventured no interest in uh, ideas. Uh, same thing at, at, at IIT. Um, you, what I learned, as I learned at the school when I was a child, was I learned well what I learned in depth. Okay, mm -hmm. and but um, but there was no, for example, you 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 weren't you weren't allowed to do, you weren't given projects to do that you didn't know how to do, or, or, or weren't directed to. And make mistakes, and so by making mistakes, you learn a lot. And and uh, so I think that was not a good part of the school. But 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 I I I, I loved what I was doing. I loved the possibilities uh, uh, there, and I, I, I worked very hard there. I took second year, uh, third year, and fourth year all at once. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> and, I, 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 and, and I took well, the studios, and I huh. took I took. Um, I took, um, uh, when I got there, I was told that my marks in um, structure <laughs> were not so good from Yale. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they said, you know, you don't want to take those that formally because you won't get a good mark in it and you, and you won't be able, as a graduate student, you, that'd be bad. So <laughs> I, I took courses with Faisler Khan. You know about Faisler Khan? I mean, he was one of the great uh, and, uh, structural engineers. Mm -hmm. Who worked with me uh, with Myron Goldsmith, and, uh, and he was the one who really crusaded the tall building in terms of construction, mm -hmm. the very tall buildings, and uh, so <clears throat> it, was, it was kind of nice. <laughs> but um, and, and he did everything in, in you know uh, in tens, so I didn't have to worry about all the numbers <laughs> coming out right. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 um, and then. 
you know, I, I, I enjoyed, I loved the, the work, working there. And my, but it was interesting that my thesis um, for my master's degree, well, uh, I did a study, a research project, and it was on long span, um, long span roof, self supporting uh, roof structures mm -hmm. uh, in concrete. There was two, one in uh, David Sharp who uh, was, wanted to teach, uh, and I were in the same class. So we were both interested in that together, so we decided to work together. And he would do his in, in, in steel first, and then I'd do mine in concrete afterwards. And uh, I did all the research on the history for him, and he did the drawings for me. <laughs> so it's <was laughs> kind of in interesting. And uh, we, you know, we did them at different years. But uh, th th I think that that... Uh, you know, the, the research thing was always very strong for me. And as, of course, mm. as you know, uh, it got stronger and stronger. And I think that in people whose work uh, I, I loved, I think people who were working with theory and, uh, and, and research and architecture, there was an intellectual, there was huge knowledge of reading and of... Um, of, of the history mm -hmm. and the uh, scientific issues, whether it was computer or whether, you know, that was later. But, and, and I think that that was, you know, something that I d sort of developed at IIT, you know, as, as an architect. Right, right. Was it difficult? What, what were some of the surprises or challenges with doing architecture school? Because you kind of had a, a unique path to it in a sense, because you had prior education, you had worked in the city room building. I was just another student. Everybody was 10 years younger than I. Yeah. I was just another student. And, you know, after people got over the fact that I was that done the Seagram building in some way or other, there, there, there was, uh, it was just, I was just one of the, one of the boys, I have to say. <laughs> right, 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 right. So after that. After that, I started to, oh, yeah. After that, I had my own office and I, I did the Seager, I did the Sadie Bronfman Center in Montreal, mm -hmm. which was again it was very much of a Mesian building, and because Fosler Khan, this great engineer, wanted me to do a precast, um, a pre tension post post tension concrete structure, mm -hmm. and you know which would have been more adventurous I should think, but, but I didn't want to do that. I wasn't interested. I wanted to learn how Mies actually, how actually all this went, went together. And uh, it also gave me a chance to do a structure, the seating shell that Mies had never been able to build. Mm -hmm. And so um, that, that's what I did. Uh, and, but it was to me a, a learning experience of just putting a building together. But I didn't have a strong sense of what I wanted to achieve uh, formally, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, it was more of a curiosity of how you did it, mm -hmm. and, and, and and of course a love of doing it. I mean, that was it, it, it always was essential. So why not continue working as an architect with your own practice? Well, because um, I did one or two interesting projects. I convinced everybody at the University of Chicago that. A, project that they were wanting to do to to uh, about the atomic bomb work that was done there or to have a reference to the uh, structure of the bomb itself mm. uh, that didn't go anywhere it wasn't very pretty what I did either and I worked on a uh, uh, for a house I was I was asked to do a house for somebody and I worked on a I was interested in in using um Vehicles on the road, what do they call it? You know, you can live in them. Um, like a trailer, uh, what do you call it? Trailer, not trailer. Tra yeah, 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 yeah. Not trailer, yeah. but whatever. Yeah. And uh, I was interested yeah. in putting those together and making something quite elegant out of it. <laughs> and I, didn't, I wasn't good at that, you know. <laughs> and <laughs> I wasn't good at, um, for, for, you know, projecting. I was not, I was hopeless at selling myself. Mm. Hated it. <laughs> and so even when I did the, with Gene, so then I, you know, at some point along the line, I joined Gene 
Summers, with Gene Summers, and um, to we I, I at one point I don't know at what point it was. I guess I joined C. Yes, it is. I at one point I thought that I would. My family had, was had investments in real estate. It was an investor. They had a company. They uh, headed by, and so we were all shareholders in it. And uh, it wasn't the shareholder part that interested me at all, but the fact that they were doing this and they weren't doing the best things that I thought that they were doing, and I thought, well, maybe I could do something there. I tried to. I went up to Toronto to so see if I could work um, with them. Of course, I couldn't. I mean, I couldn't work with people who's so such a different point of view. And so that's when I started to work with Gene Summers as a developer. Hmm. Because I, I, we, we had a, 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 an office as a developer uh, architects because I thought if you could control the, you know, he was the head of a huge firm at that point. We decided, he decided to give that up and to do this, this thing with me. And so, but the idea was that, um, you know, you, that you could control much more of the process if you um, mm -hmm. were the developer and the architect. Oh, you know? yeah. yeah. And, and, and so... But the problem is, you can't do both very well, you know. And so th then the, 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 the problem of, um, of, 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 you know, the, the um, urban mm -hmm. renewal mm -hmm. uh, was happening. And of course, so that meant everything was coming down everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I saw it in Chicago, it was falling, you know, the city with some of the greatest buildings in, 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 in North America. And, oh, excuse me, I have to, I, was, I have to uh, oil the whistle. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, actually, Gene and I, you know, we, we won the competition for this place in Chicago, the name of which I can't, you know, it's, it's this very famous uh, place where everything is taken down and the Biltmore. And we won the, the competition to do a new building, uh, develop a new hotel, not, not, not with the Biltmore. And um, so when we went to get funding, you know, to, to, to go ahead with the project, the people would say, well, who, who is your who's your hotel person? We said, we are. What's your tra track record? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that didn't go very far. So we decided that the Biltmore Hotel was there, and we were both very interested in the possibilities of bringing that back to being an important place in the, in the city. And, uh, you know, and so we, we, we bought that. Just outright, I think, wow. for, I don't know. Anyway, it was, it was viable. And so that we worked on that, and, and, and it was that at that time, actually after. I have to go back a minute, because I, when I couldn't, you know, get all these projects going, like I told you mm -hmm. about, I I went back, and I was doing the Sadie Bronfman Center. That's it, and I I I, I saw all these gray stone buildings, and I learned to learn see the Montreal city again, and so so that. So that was, you know, uh, that was done in 67, 68. And um, this was a time of expo here. Mm -hmm. And so then the other things happened, but I was very aware of the quality of the city. And I, I wanted to, I wanted, I, I didn't want what was happening in Chicago and everywhere in the United States to happen to, 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 to the city of Montreal. I see. And so, while we were doing these other projects, I, I, I came back and, and, and forth, of course, and, and I actually bought the place I'm sitting in right now. <laughs> it was a house that belonged to an old Montreal, which was redlined. All the, it was, you know, a place you couldn't make investment in mm -hmm. anything, and it was the most beautiful buildings, but it had fallen into disuse. And, you know, the usual American story. And so um, 
I, I bought this house and then I thought, oh my goodness, what am I going to do with this? I mean, I have a <laughs> firm in Los Angeles and Chicago and and so, but then all these, and I'd been taking photographs because taking photographs was a sort of a way of looking at the city and um, a wonderful way of looking and learning about the cities because, uh, and, and it was also related to a course I'd been taking at IIT in, in uh, urban city planning. Hmm. And, you know, how does a city grow? How does it, well, okay, theory is there, but on the ground, how does it grow? Right. So I thought of these greystone buildings and, and with Richard Fair, who was a young photographer, uh, who, British guy who, who was doing a master's at, at, uh, uh, at um, the Art Institute of Chicago. And I liked his work. And so I said, well, come with, and he was, he used a, 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 a view camera. And I tried, oh, it was such a nuisance to set all that up. And so, <laughs> uh, and, he, and, and so I had to find the places in Montreal. There was no, the history of Montreal was zero at that point. Hmm. You know, there were a couple of places, big places, but then it was actually a, 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 um, a, um, a, a city that had a fortification, a fortified city. Nobody, <laughs> anyway. So, but I went around. And I, so we started. I, I was fascinated, and I went, went around. I borrowed my, uh, my my mother's chauffeur and his car, and and we went around, and and I wrote down the, the time of day. The light was right on certain buildings, and finding the buildings. Hmm. Anyway, so this this was a great a uh, 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 project. So then, because then, then I was told that. Um, You know, then, 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 I, then oh no, it was from re, re, doing, re, photographing, that people would say, "Why are you photographing like the hotel? Why are you photographing that old building? It's going to come down." And so, I, 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 I came back to, to photograph these buildings. I came back. No, I was photographing them, but I came back eventually, from being a developer in Chicago, mm -hmm. and well, basically, uh, mostly our work is in Los Angeles, to doing tremendous research and um, uh, active activism in the street mm -hmm. to stop demolition here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and at that time, I bought, bought this house at some point, and that's when I came back to Montreal. I see. So we, we, we just we covered 30 years just now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That sounds great. Something that you had, because we had corresponded before this uh, conversation via email a little bit, and um, you had mentioned that, you know, the concept or idea of architecture as a public concern is kind of the through line uh, throughout your, your, yes, your work, yes, yes. you know, and um, I guess the, the, the so somewhat large question I have for you is that... Uh, do you think that the public's perception and understanding of architecture, uh, I guess throughout your life, but even maybe just today, um, is that the public misunderstands what it is or that they even undervalue it? Uh, the reason I set up the, C the CCA was, well, first of all, I'd started collecting drawings a long time ago when I was at Vassar, I guess, or just afterwards. Cause I, I had a friend who was, uh, she, she was a historian but she 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 was dealing in in uh, a private dealer in in drawings and you know I just I just, you know, the sense of a drawing where you, you get so close to the the person who is making it and the ideas of the person who is making it and so I uh, you know had been collecting drawings and then I had them at Yale when I was there oh I dragged them around with me in Chicago when I was there <laughs> and then um, I wanted to people. I realized that people didn't understand anything about architecture. They're, they're, they couldn't even, there was no language. They couldn't even tell you what it was. It was just a piece of commerce. Huh. And they were destroying all of the, the kind of history of, of, of a place. And, and uh, so I, I, I became very invested in, in uh, stopping, stopping this. But at the same time, also, insisting on the for the city uh, 
so, so what would be built in the city? You said something earlier. If there'd be no other people, you know, like like Phyllis, that the, <laughs> you know, cities would be better. Yes, and my idea was that you at least did one good building a year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. in ten years you'd have something. But um, and that was hard to do uh, uh, because you had to have people who were going to do things well. And um, so I, I, I became, you know, very strong in her heritage. Montreal, but I uh, and and formed it, and mm -hmm. you know it's still the, the, it's, it's 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 developed wonderfully well into the major uh, conservation place. But I, I I wasn't interested in conservation at that point. Conservation was you know sort of lace curtain stuff, and I wasn't interested in that. I was interested in the urban. I was interested in the whole city. Mm -hmm. And my idea was, wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to do a whole community? And my other sense was that if you had this gore, uh, this gore you not problem of having to say, okay, I'm going <clears> to <throat> save this beautiful building. Or this other large community, which, you know, mm -hmm. it had to be what the people really, what meant most to people. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I operated and set up. Uh, heritage, Montreal. And then after a while, you know, then, 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 then you know, it was difficult. We'd get funding. You never knew how long it would last for. So then we raised money, and and then we, so we formed a real organization. But then uh, I was frustrated because we were, you know, we we, we did courses on on you know Bill Gates, but I I just felt that the people people need, needed to know. So much about architecture to just to know what how and fascinating and wonderful it, it was, and so with my uh, collection of, of drawings, which grew into quite an interesting about two thousand uh, sheets of work on on architecture, wow. some a couple of them of complete buildings wow. uh, uh, you know, over time, and, and um, so it was that with that that I you know set up. Uh, um, said Canadian Center for Architecture. That's a whole other story. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the and so it was, it it was that it was architecture is international, you know. It, 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 from the very beginning, it always be was and and so uh, the collection was for well, not Canadian. It's called the Canadian Center for Architecture. I wanted to call it the Center for Architecture, but I was told by. The people who allow you to have a certain name, that, that wasn't enough. So I thought, well, I'll put a Canadian and, on it and make sure that, 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 that I'm head place here, mm -hmm. which, of course, it's, it has the, the, what we have in Canadian architecture is very, very small. But, uh, you know, we were collecting, Richard was collecting, uh, he became the curator for us, and he, he, we, he, we formed this superb, magnificent, wonderful, uh, collection of photography together and uh, started getting archives and uh, so you know grew that place here and I felt that if there was a place that was concerned with architecture people would say oh <laughs> and there wouldn't be discussion there would be debate mm -hmm. and and but the uh, thing was that it wasn't just any old thing it had to be you know uh, work that has being at the leading edge of of, 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 of of what can happen and also the debates about those things and, and also, you know, questioning always. Not, it wasn't a place where we say this is good and this is bad, terrible mm. idea. Mm. But it was a question of why, you know, what, what has happened? Why does this happen? And, and, and so this questioning and looking at things that nobody looks at. Right. For example, um, I don't know. Uh, uh, Macadam or something like that. You know, th th that you know, from a little thing, something very huge mm -hmm. can, can can come come out. And I suppose that's the same thing as starting with the facts, mm. rather than starting with a dream. Mm -hmm. The dream is always there. The dream is always there, but the dream is is is, is, is a great mm -hmm. mist. And it had needs a it needs a road. The road bends and 
but it needs to be continued. This kind of, you know, the kind of, I guess you could call it disconnect between the general public and, let's say, architecture, right? Um, do you think that exists? Like, do you have a sense of why that exists? Um, sure, sure, sure. It's a, the bloody, bloody dollar. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. You know, that everything became commercial mm -hmm. and it gets worse and worse that way. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, right now, there, there are all sorts of horrible things that are again happening in Montreal, which we're having to fight again, mm. going back 45 years, you know. But uh, sure, it's it because. There's no respect for ideas. There's no sense of a morality. There's, a, there, there's, there's, a, and this is happening. This happened everywhere in Europe, not so much, uh, but in, in North America, absu absolutely. You know, the developer has become um, a dreadful thing. But it's not. You know, it's, we we say to the society. Go into business and make money and profit, and that's what you should do. But cities are the places that have to make the regulations that control what happens. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it would be nice if if developers were really educated and, and, and were there, wanted to make a better society, okay? Mm -hmm. But they more unfortunately, it's kind of a group of people that want to put money in their pockets, and they put lots of it in their pockets. Yeah. But the um, so so that there's no there's no respect for the past. There's no respect for ritual. There's no respect for ideas. Hmm. You know, and so architecture has always these things. You know, architecture has just become commerce, and so it's terrible. You know, these glass skyscrapers, and you know. They're taken really out of catalogs, and uh, or, you know, with no thought, just you know, containers for something rather. Not any very good containers either. You know, the, 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 that's what people see as architecture. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I was going to ask you since you you know you you've worked on the Sear Grand Building in New York. Like, have you been to New York? Re I mean, recently before the pandemic, and what do you think of all of those? New building, the super uh, talls, the all super the tall, you know, the super trendy well, ones you see in magazines. I tell you, I, I tell you what I think about it. I think it's uh, it's. <laughs> At first, I it's, thought you were drawing a building. I said, "Wow, it's a very curvy building," but it's dollar sign. Nice. No, no, yeah. it's 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 a disgrace. Mm. It's it, it's you know, it caters to the people who have much too much money. And again, you know, New York is a place of you know of people can't live there anymore. Yeah. I mean, it's so so it's socially despicable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it at some point playing devil's advocate here? Because I do agree uh, with a lot of what you're saying. Um, but it, I mean, all, uh, all, <laughs> I actually, as I said that, I was like, I should probably have rephrased that sentence. I, I agree with what you're saying for a lot of reasons, but at, at some point, is it not the architect's responsibility? Because a lot of architects would say, well, like I'm hired to design the building, the developer, those you know, aren't architects. and I want to design the building. Those are, those are, those are, those are, those are hired hands. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there's a difference between architects and architects too. Mm. You know, uh, most well, actually, some some of the architects I respect uh, are doing lots of work now. Liz Diller, uh, Diller and Scafidio, you know, uh, she, she she they're extraordinary in terms of their breadth of uh, questioning of, of of research of of what they do, their sensibilities. I mean, just incredible. Uh, Peter Peter Eisen has never made any money. Mm -hmm. uh, But but the Diller and, and, and Rem Coolhouse, you know, they became these star architects, and um, so. But there, there's so few, and, and, and I, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, once you when you have that busy is that busy, uh, too many things to do, mm. you, you know, see, the thing done well tends to suffer, and so mm. we'll see. Maybe there are ways of doing it, you know. Because of the use of the uh, computer, which of course make, makes it 
easier to do a lot of work, but uh, and to and to even d design. You know, we we we're interested at the CCA in collecting uh, in, in of you know in uh, architecture design within the computer. That is using the computer system, not not using it as a copy machine and stuff. Yeah. Um, hence, I assume people like Greg Lynn, who, whose name is on their mug. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you, you raise up a, a lot of good questions, one of which is that uh, my brain was thinking of, well, when an office becomes the size of like 300 people spread across whatever, like how does that even, do things yeah. become kind of watered down at some point? Like how does that work? Inevitably, inevitably, mm -hmm. inevitably, inevitably. And I guess, you know, then there's, a, you know, keeping the firm going and then all of a sudden being able to, conceive of something else but it's 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 just too bad it's just too bad this society of plenty we have you know the world's going to disappear one of these days because of that yeah i i i hope not or if maybe that'll be far enough in the future <laughs> um there, there's another kind of uh, phrase that you wrote uh which is the democratization of city governments governance rather um as it pertains to architecture and urbanism um, and as a way to also, I believe, to kind of address or solve the, the, the question of um, architecture as a public uh, oh, thing, concern. right? Yeah. Uh, but I was wondering, like, what do you mean by the, the democratization of city governance? I mean the, the fact that <clears throat> mostly the, 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 the government, the, 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 they set up zoning issues, they, have, uh, they, they give permission to buildings, to be built with no with no design intent, with no mm. idea intent, and why should a couple of people who are not trained and have, don't think all of their lives about what should happen in a society and in, in a city, and uh, uh, why should they then have the possibility of, of doing, making all these regulations and laws and 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 you know, approving demolition, uh, permission to build, which is incorrect, and all of that. It's the people who know what is necessary, that live in the place. And we've uh, that experience has been so huge here in Montreal. For example, in the Vieux-Port, which is, you know, the, the port of Montreal is how the city started, and um, the, the in the 17th century. And the... Um, so, you know, it, it grew, but then just the whole town where, where I'm sitting right now grew, grew around it. Of course, it was a place where people could work and, and live and create, whatever. But the, um, there were people who had all sorts of developers, had all sorts of developers. Big, you know, one of those, what is that big developer used to be in the United States who, 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 Anyway, I can't even think of his name now. But, you know, they, they, they're going to come up here and do one of their marvelous shopping centers on, 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 the, on the port in Montreal. Uh -huh. What has this got to do with our society? Mm -hmm. You know, what has this got to do with the history, with how, how, special, how this place has developed? And uh, it was, you know, so uh, through Heritage Montreal, we managed to create the first public... Um, Consult uh, public hearings in Montreal, and um, it has made such a difference. You know, it's mm. because you could go through a process. I'm, 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 you know, and we're we're fighting with that all the time. But at least you, you, people, you don't know, kill each other, and they don't, or they don't, you know, they, they can develop some level of respect and 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 analyze because it's a whole process, mm. and that's that's so important. So. You, you know that's uh, uh, and, and then I think I mentioned at the very beginning mm -hmm. these uh, table de consultation, these tables of a community where you look at what the problems are and 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 when a developer uh, and you you bring that to the city or when when a developer comes in you work with that developer trying to make something that, that's much better. This has happened the whole time, mm -hmm. and um, so th that's what I mean. And also. When the city has a budget, you know, what 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 are the major issues you want to have? There should that budget should be the 
the, the structure of it, the kind of large pieces of it, should be c- citizens in, involved hmm. in discussing th- that. You know, the, the city always has a possibility of saying no to any of these things because these are all uh, advisory committees. But you form a consciousness of how you can build well and how you can build for people and people can be involved. You know, you get, you get the situation of urban renewal where you kick people out yeah. of their housing and, 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 and the sort of situation in New York with those uh, very, very tall buildings. I mean, these are so inhuman. And uh, so that'll happen, you know, if you don't, and the developers doing their nonsense. Well, 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 well unless there is a, and the city cannot, it doesn't know what to do unless there's a real discourse, a discussion, a working with mm-hmm. people about what are the possibilities. And you don't win everything, but you can make, make a huge difference. I've always felt like we, 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 meaning humans, I think collectively, could use more architecture, those who, as you just mentioned, are experts and have spent their lives thinking about these things in public policy yes. spaces. Um, but so, I, so that, that to you, that is the, that is the core issue. That is one of the ways, that's probably the, the primary way which we would maybe resolve or better the situation that, that we were describing is by having a process that's much more discernible and a process that involves, you know, experts. Documented and everything, yes. Yeah. Wait, so you said that Montreal did not have public hearing until fairly recently? <laughs> that is nuts. That's crazy. Until, well, we, we didn't have it until, actually, the very first one was a project to cover over a street with a shopping center near McGill University. <laughs> that was my family. Developers were in that. And I fought that <laughs> completely. And, 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 and we got... And 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 and, and it, we we won. I mean, it, we were. Uh, I worked with this with with the Chamber of Commerce, etc., who were just completely against this, because like, sometimes the Chamber of Commerce can be okay. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but 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 you know, it's, it's just it's changed all of these things. And you know, when I see other places where, where universities or other places where people are sort of at each other's. Next about things, you just sort of say, "Well, let, let's let's what see, see what the problems are," instead of all this emotion always comes into it. It's, you know, thank heavens, but 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 you have to know what what the facts are. You know, what what the possibilities are, and you know, you you know of the big dig in Boston. Well, in order to you know that when right. when they made this huge uh, underground. Uh, uh, highway. Oh no, not uh, familiar actually. It was, it was oh maybe twenty years ago, hmm. and um, th- this was a huge, huge change in, in, in Boston, and they were so. Um, and then there was also you know what, what kind of public they, they would create parks and linear parks and stuff. And the, the question was to discuss with people what 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 what, what was planned. Because they needed, they needed to have to have that, and it took them ten years of this of discussing and, and until people could see. Yes, I don't really like this, but I can see that it it would be better in, in, for, for for everybody. So you know that's what they were aiming at, mm-hmm. aiming at. I, I don't know total consensus, but an, an understanding of what was happening. This is so necessary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, why should we be acted on? Why should people not be able to, you know, it's like people who are very poor who can't make any choices. I go, mm. This is abominable. That's actually a good way of, of describing it because when things are constructed in your neighborhood, in your city, and you have no say, it's an act that's being forced upon you. I mean, it's, it's a right. physical structure you now have to contend with, yeah. or a space that's now gone, or a program that's now there, or not there, or whatever it might be. It's interesting speaking with you also because you, I mean, according to Wikipedia, you were born in 1927. 
And, you know, this is like year 2021, 20, right? What has it been like seeing the uh, architecture and urbanism, you know, that kind of discourse and things being built evolve and change over that period of time? You know, as you come across, you see the international style and the whatever, whatever else, the postmodernism, and then you have archigrammic, all of these things. Like, do, does it tr paint a, a, a trajectory that's hopeful? <laughs> or like, <laughs> well, uh, I, I want to say something. I'm laughing because. There was a wonderful film that was done by a, a, a very good uh, film uh, person here in, in Montreal, uh, Joseph Hillel, mm -hmm. and it, it's called City Dreamers. And there are four non-Algerians in that. Cornelia Oberlander, this great landscape architect, uh, Blanche Van Ginkel, uh, amazing architects that actually saved old Montreal and who she was head of the first woman head of the School of Architecture, and in, 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 in she worked with Le Corbusier. She, she, she was the person who designed the rooftop of um, of, um, uh, of uh, Marseille. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and, and then uh, Denise Scott Brown. Oh. And Denise is very funny because she said, she said, you know, I'm proud to be so old. She said, I've seen everything happen three times over. <laughs> and that's about it. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I is there a hopeful future for <laughs> for the rest of us? You know. Oh, I think you just you know. I'm not so sure. I I I, I, I I'm hopeful to a certain extent about the public process that seems to be mm -hmm. working more in other cities. There, there are places where it really works well. And at the same time, I'm disastered by what's happening now everywhere. Yeah. yeah. And also, of course, the environmental question, you know, we're not going to. So, so I, I, I guess the only thing you could do is pu push, you know, the Voltaire thing about um, look after your own garden. But your own garden has to be a very big garden. <laughs> Don't, your own garden is this blue planet that we have to keep track of. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, a couple of final fun ones. Um, what is your favorite building? And if it is the Seagram building, <laughs> then what is your second favorite building? <laughs> well, there, there are tons of favorite buildings. I guess one of my very favorite buildings is Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. Wow. wow. You know it? Well, I, I know of it, yeah. I've not seen it. Oh, it's such a fantastic building. The space of it, the structure of it, the uh, trajectory, the materials, the oh, it's just a uh, an, an extraordinary building. And then, of course, I like a lot of the people who are working now. I mentioned them, you know, Bram and Liz, and, uh, well, when they were doing really terrific work, and Peter, I think... They were all they were all working in in, in Saha. Mm -hmm. and they're all working in, in a way where they're working on something much larger than the individual uh, building and, and and with real intelligent approaches, you know, to 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 these things. Some with high level of theory, some more pragmatic. But anyway, mm -hmm. th th these are uh, you know these are the things. But the younger generation, I I don't know how people can. Uh, you know what 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 they can do now. The as as I guess the bad thing is that the city st structures get tighter and tighter. What you can do yeah. as an architect, yeah. No, I, I more think, and more I restrictive think is what I want to say. Yeah. Yes, yes, I, I think that's the case, and I, I've obviously I've often of late wondered about if that's just going to become more and more restrictive, or what's going to happen because at some point. It, it becomes so stifling that it's it's difficult to actually produce anything yeah. creative, yeah. and then yeah. it gets built. Yeah. Um, and a slightly a, a slight variation on that question is: Do you have a favorite place or space or spot that's not necessarily a physical, you know, a one building? Well, you know, there was a thing about uh, you asked me in, in, in the you know the kind of questionnaire you sent out to me uh, about. You know, what do I do to 
cool out. <laughs> oh, yeah. And so, you know, in, for 20 years, more than 20 years, I sailed every summer for two or three weeks with the same friends in, off the coast of Turkey and Greece. That was such heaven. Now we can't do it. You know, the waters are polluted and things like that. It was the most glorious experience you could ever have. You know, and, and I was, of course, very interested. I was very interested in how the land met the water and, and of course, the great cities and the, and the, the structures, the, the, the great, great uh, uh, theaters, you know, these the great, great tombs and you know, all of these things. It was just very rich. It was wonderful. That's a lovely note to end it on, I think. Yeah. Um, okay, great. This was um, tremendous. Uh, we thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, I, I, it was uh, rather interesting in looking at photographs of you up there without, <laughs> ever, ever, without ever, ever seeing so, a twinkle in the yeah. eye. Thank you, everybody, for listening to this episode. If you like what we're doing, if you liked this recording, then show your support by leaving a review in the Apple Podcast app. You can also find us on Spotify and YouTube, so make sure to subscribe on those platforms and leave comments and yada, yada, yada. And uh, what else? We have a hotline. You can send a text message or call and it would automatically go to voicemail. The number is 213-222-6950. We've got a lot of your messages. We're trying to catch up on it. Uh, but basically, if you have any questions about something that was said in one of the interviews, any guest suggestions, any stories you want to share or a topic you would want us to talk about, well, send us a message. We're also on all of the social media platforms. Uh, I was going to say Pinterest, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. You can mm -hmm. send us a message there or, you know, get a notification every time we publish an episode. It's also another way to find out what we're about. Yep. And thanks again for Phyllis coming on to the show. And we will talk to you guys next week or sooner. Bye. Bye-bye.